Uh, my name is Vinod Erangovan. I'm a postdoctoral researcher and a member of the Early Career Advisory Group of eLife. Uh, just a quick word about our host today, eLife. Uh, eLife is a nonprofit mission driven organization um, that's involved in changing the way a scientific publication is uh, currently done. Um, and uh, we, as part of the Early Career Advisory Group or Early Career Advisory Board, uh, does uh, do a lot of uh, uh, inputs on how research evaluation and research communication can be changed. And uh, one such initiative is uh, the ECI Wednesday webinar, where we try to uh, focus on issues that are relevant for early career researchers. And uh, in this webinar series, we will also deal about uh, things that are uh, important to early career researchers in changing the uh, changing the way how we value uh, scientific research. Um, so to give a short introduction or, or to set a background for this particular webinar, uh, when I was in uh, the first few months of my PhD, I used an antibody, uh, which was reported in another publication. Um, so over several months, I was trying to get uh, some desired results that was reported earlier, uh, but I couldn't get that desired result uh, because I was using uh, an antibody of a similar uh, lot, uh, but with certain differences. So this uh, made me realize that if I do not use the right resource that has been already reported, then I would end up wasting several months. Uh, so that's exactly why uh, we need to have some identifiers. And uh, I'd like to now welcome our speaker today, uh, who is Anita uh, Bandowski. Uh, she's uh, uh, head of the uh, uh, Center for Research in uh, uh, Biological System, where she leads an initiative on research identifiers. Um, so she'll be talking today about what the RRIDs or research resource identifiers are and how we can use them in order to have reproducibility at the maximal level in biological and uh, life sciences. Um, thank you, Anita, for joining us. Uh, now I'll pass it on to Anita for um, starting this uh, discussion on RRIDs. Anita, please. Thank you so much. And <clears throat> please do let me know if there's any kind of audio issues. Um, or anything else that I need to address. Um, and I've, I've uh, changed the, the uh, name of the webinar because it's just, it, it happens. So how to impress your friends by making great mice repeatedly and why does it matter? Um, I thought that was a little bit funny. Um, our IDs, I'm gonna get all of the acknowledgements done in the first slides because um, if I forget to do this, I am very sorry, but they are funded by uh, lots and lots of different um, grants and cooperative agreements with the, uh, primarily with the NIH. Um, there's also some non-NIH uh, um, uh, funding associated with this project. Um, but primarily, this is an agreement and a project that is an agreement between uh, the National Institutes of Health, lots and lots of journal editors, um, and several researchers who can provide some guidance and some, some uh, platforms to be able to um, accomplish all of the things that we have accomplished. So Neuroscience Information Framework, DKNet, these are all um, uh, sources of funding for the RID project. Okay, so who is better at doing reproducible science? Is it us or is it our grandmothers? And so I'm going to pose a question about what it means to actually um, have reproducible research. And here is a reproducible research paper that I particularly like to make every uh, few weekends. Um, this is a stew, starts out as a stew. But the first thing that I always do when I try to reproduce one of these papers is I try to figure out if I have all of the listed reagents or if I need something else. So the step, the first step is always the materials and then later we talk about a um, procedure and how do we move forward in terms of creating this. So if we look at a paper from not eLife, what we find is that there is this, um, this one reagent here, um, which is actually a, a nude mouse. So these, mi these mice, these PK skid mice, these are actually missing an immune system. They're really wonderful um, animals because um, if you are trying to express a disease, um, the immune system doesn't get in your way, everything is fully expressed. 
um, and these mice get very, very, very sick very quickly. So this particular mouse was actually purchased from Jackson Labs in Bar Harbor, and that's what the author tells us. <clears throat> However, there's a problem, because I'm not going to drive to Bar Harbor. I mean, it's lovely this time of year, but I am going to go to the Jackson Labs website, and I'm going to try and figure out if they have this mouse. And when I do that in various ways, I largely either get multiple mice or I get no mice. In this case, I'm showing the case where there's no mice. So what do you do in that situation? We have a failure at step one. And in fact, when we look across the entirety of the uh, literature, and this was done um, for hundreds of papers um, that were actually uh, all identified by uh, Vasilevsky, uh, by Nicole Vasilevsky, uh, and this, this is a while back, but in, in fact, she found that across all kinds of impact factors across all sorts of um, sub-disciplines of biology, um, we could find only about half of the research resources. So this is a real problem. If you can only find half of the antibodies uh, consistently, half the cell lines, then those papers are not reproducible. We can't figure out what we've used. <clears throat> but the thing that really struck me is when I reached out to the author um, of this paper, he got back to me within just a few hours and told me what was the stock number of that particular mouse. And it's like, huh, really? Well, what if there was such a journal? Let's just imagine that there might be such a journal um, that would actually use and give you this magical ability to take the same mouse, this is the same nod skid um, mouse. And if you, one of the things you might want to notice is that nod PK skid is not really the name of this mouse. This, this mouse has a horrible name. So uh, lots of authors have nicknamed this thing. And you notice that they nickname it in different ways. But for this particular set of authors um, publishing in eLife, they've also provided the RRID, which is, um, it tells you that this is the Jackson Lab mouse, and this is the same stock number that the other author was using. Um, but instead of having, um, you know, just the name, what you actually find here is if you click on this, you will actually end up on this mouse strain data sheet with lots and lots of information um, and uh, a lot of other, um, and of course you can buy the mouse. So that's kind of a big one too. So how do we get here? Um, this was a very long process and I'm not going to say it, it was short. It was actually uh, fraught with lots and lots of pitfalls and dangers. Um, we hatched the idea somewhere around 2009. I think that was the first, you know, written account for we thought that the journals would really be the key to solving this kind of a problem of, you know, having no, um, no reliable information in the journal. Um, but we found out after a couple of years of trying to change a single journal, the Journal of Neuroscience, um, that actually journals will not really change by themselves. They, they don't really like to stick out like a sore thumb. Um, and what they would like to do potentially is to work in aggregate. Um, funders also have a very big stake to, <clears throat> in this game because they would like the research that they fund to be more reproducible. And um, <clears throat> so over a series of three meetings with um, the editors in chief of some of the major um, journals in at least the field of neuroscience, we had cobbled together a, an entire uh, project that was based on putting these identifiers, like you saw in that paper that I just showed from 2019 in eLife, into the paper itself. And we were just trying to ask the question, okay, so if we have uh, a few month pilot, would it be possible to ask authors to actually do this task? We found out lots of things about project management along the way, um, uh, but, we can leave that, but essentially, what, I, I will actually tell you this story because um, this is cool. So we had this entire international agreement and we had um, lots and lots of different journals from across all the publishers. And then we were all supposed to start on um, asking the question, this is for a three month pilot project. That's all we had um, agreement for. So we had this, this uh, agreement and it was great. And then only one journal really started on time asking anybody to do anything. 
but several other journals started like within the month. So we said, well, that's pretty good. But then there were other journals who were absolutely gun ho who just never started until I started asking them lots of questions like, hey, when are you guys going to start? Um, and that's when we really learned lots of things about project management. Not only do you have to make sure that um, somebody um, you know, agrees to do something, but then you actually have to ask them again. <laughs> and so they were really, they were on board, they were going to do this, but you know, um, they often get, people often get very busy and they're like, oh, was that supposed to happen now? Um, I don't know. So, um, but I, I will have to say that um, as opposed to the three month pilot project, which we were uh, originally intending, no one stopped. So uh, the interesting thing about that is now we're in the sixth year of our three month pilot. So how do we get the publishers on board? And this is what we had thought about in those uh, three kind of series of meetings. And we thought, well, we can't really burden the authors um, more than, than, than necessary. And so we've put together a website um, that took all of the relevant uh, sources of, of data, um, lots of antibodies, um, IC lack information, which you'll see in a second, Cellosaurus, uh, all, a lot of the mouse repositories, or hopefully all the mouse repositories and others. And we put everything together into a single portal that would be easy and consistent to search, um, where the identifiers would be really easy to find. And of course, the help desk, which um, I can't say enough. Um, it doesn't happen a lot that you have that we have authors with questions, but when we do, we we really are proud to answer them within a day. So <clears throat> that is um, one of the key drivers of being able to do this. So currently, our IDs are for antibodies, cell lines, transgenic organisms, plasmids, and then there's kind of a catch-all resource research resources, which are software projects, databases, core facilities, and other things. And we're actually starting to move into instruments. Um, along with a group out of Florida State University and uh, University of Vermont. But it is not for data and it is not for code. We have DOIs for those things um, and there are proper data citations. So we will not take data or code, but we will take software projects. So the difference between code and project is a little funky, but if you, um, you can think of it this way, I have a piece of code that I would like to um, store, and that is the piece of code that goes into my um, uh, that goes into my paper because I wrote it. That's great. That's a piece of code, and that would be covered under the DOI umbrella. Whereas if I used MATLAB, for example, in my paper, and I do not have the code for MATLAB, MATLAB will not release that to me. They will, uh, you know, SPSS will not release that. I just want to say, hey, I used SPSS of this version, and that would be the way that I would refer to that project, that, that entire software package, that entire software project, as opposed to here is my piece of code. This is an entire uh, application that I used. So those are the differences. Okay, so there are times when I can't find my RRID, right? And so if you scroll on the very front page of the RRID portal, what you will find is this lovely button, add a resource. And what that will lead you to is it will ask you what kind of resource would you like to add? Is it an antibody? Is it a cell line? Is it an organism? And for organisms, we have to understand we are not the experts. Um, on all of these organisms. There are lots and lots of them. I do not know fish genetics from, uh, from frog genetics. So, but there thankfully are lots and lots of people who do know about this. So the most common um, rodents that are used are mice and those are right on top. And so what we try to do with this, um, with this page is if you end up on a page that looks like this because you're trying to add a mouse or a rat, there's a little thing that says, hey, submit data here and we try to get you right to the submission form for your new mouse. So then you would go in and you would fill out the form at MGI and they would provide the RRID. We are only the aggregators and the holders and, and a way to make uh, referencing these things easier, but we do not know all things about mouse genetics. That is the job of the Mouse Genome Informatics Database rat genome informatics database and others. And if you have um, places where you want to, for example, submit, um, submit to uh, submit your fish or submit your frog, there are repositories here that will take those. 
Okay. Um, when we looked at the first 100 papers that were published, um, and this is back in 2015, um, we sort of redid the analysis that Vasilevsky did, and we looked at the issue of the journal right before and the issue of the journal after the pilot project started, and we found that antibodies had a huge change in the ability for somebody to go in and look at them and identify what it was that they were actually using. So your initial problem with um, Vino, with the, um, with the antibody, you used the wrong one and you weren't sure which one you used. Well, if you had been using one of the ones from, uh, from a paper that had used the RRID initially, maybe you would have been um, uh, guided a little bit uh, to, uh, towards the right reagent. Um, okay. So what? Readers can identify stuff. Well, that's great, but can these things help my science? Can they actually help me? Um, and I don't know how many people have seen this film. It is fantastic. Um, this is a very hard film to watch, but it is um, it is the story of uh, a woman uh, in, the, in the South uh, in the 1950s named Henrietta Lacks. She died of cancer, but her cells, HeLa, um, cells still exist. And in fact, um, I would highly recommend um, both the film and one of the things that you kind of have to understand is some of these reagents, especially the immortalized cell line and the immortal cell lines, these are from people. They have a sex, they have an origin um, where what kind of cancer that they actually are. And uh, these are associated with real human beings. So there are some ethical issues um, that I will not have time to get into here. But um, that is one thing that many of us don't always realize because they're just little things in a dish. But that was a human being at some point um, with a particular disease. And one of the things that um, I felt was really interesting in the movie is Oprah, who plays one of the main characters, the, the daughter of Henrietta, Henrietta Lacks. Um, she, she was uh, shown the HeLa cell and how it spreads everywhere. And what she said was, yep, HeLa's coming to get you. And in fact, it did. Um, there are a lot of cell lines that were overgrown with HeLa and the authentic stock doesn't exist anymore. And this is one of those examples. Um, so basically what happened here is that this particular cell line, so if I'm going to type in um, and I'm going to look for my cell line that I have used, I would get back to a page that shows something like this. Hey, this is my cell line. Here's where I potentially got it. And um, this one has a comment. It's a problematic cell line. This one's contaminated. This one actually has been shown to be a HeLa derivative. So uh, what happened is somewhere along the line, just like it might happen in your own lab where some undergrad comes in, sneezes, and suddenly all of your cell lines have become HeLa, this has also happened um, at the stock centers. And only until you sequence those, um, uh, those cell lines that you might find out that in fact, those are not authentic cell lines that I thought I was using. There are other problems. For example, you can imagine that some people are misdiagnosed. Well, cell lines are misdiagnosed too. So misidentified cell lines exist. Um, they were first thought to be, for example, the hep G2, first thought to be a hepatocytoma. Now it's known to be a hepatocarcinoma. So if you still think or your advisor still thinks that it's a um, cytoma, well, guess what? You're actually studying the wrong kind of cancer because the cell line was misdiagnosed. Um, so again, bringing this back to a human realm, we can understand lots of patients are misdiagnosed, but because these tissues come from patients, what we can do is we can very quickly understand, hey, there's a misdiagnosis that has occurred. And so um, there, uh, there are people out there who are trying to figure out what are all of the uh, cells out there that are not authentic? And this is one of them. Uh, this is Christopher Korch. Um, he's uh, at the University of uh, Colorado. And he has sequenced a lot of these cell lines. And then he went out and he said, hey, journals, look, this is not the right conclusion because this conclusion is wrong because it's about the wrong cancer, for example. 
Um, so he has been having trouble trying to figure out how to get these papers retracted or how to get um, uh, you know, notes put on some of these papers. And he and others have formed a group called the International Cell Line Authentication Committee. Um, they suggest lots of things. So if you're going to be using a cell line, you should be authenticating it. And I, I have to you know, happily report that actually the number of, um, of papers that have an authentication or a contamination of cell line statements um, really goes up when you talk to uh, when you're talking about eLife. So uh, we love that journal. Um, and there are others who also do a really good job, but most don't. Uh, most people, most scientists don't realize that you have to actually authenticate your cell lines, that you have to find out what the actual cell line is. And you should do that several times during the experiment. If you don't want to do the test yourself, um, this is a, an STR profiling. It's a relatively simple genetic test. Um, if you don't want to do it yourself, you can send it off to ATCC and they'll do it for like a hundred bucks. So um, in any case, spot checking these things is a really good idea. But how many of these things are there out there? Well, we have over 730 listed. 730 is a long, long list. But if you're looking at the website, um, at the RRID website, you search for your cell line and magically um, those warnings and those error, you know, those messages come right up. They don't always um, exist in all of the vendors that you might be uh, buying this from. Um, certainly ATCC is one of the, um, uh, is one of the founders of ICLAC. So those warnings and, and messages are all over their website, but some, uh, we have definitely found some cell banks that do not know that a cell line might be contaminated. Um, so beware is, uh, is all I'm going to say. And when we've looked actually across about 2 million uh, journal articles uh, in the open access literature, we found 150,000 roughly um, that actually used a cell line. And then we matched the name to any of those 730 plus um, misidentified or contaminated cell lines. And we said, well, how many papers are actually affected by this that are using cell lines? And it turned out to be just over 16% that very closely match the name of the cell line with the name of one of these contaminated cell lines. Um, and then when we looked at the 634 papers, which at that time were uh, all that was published uh, with, with an RRID identifying the cell line, then we found um, that 5.3%, 5.4% of those papers actually had used one of these um, misidentified or uh, contaminated cell lines. And actually we looked deeper and it was mostly the misidentified ones, which are safe to use as long as you know which cancer this is, right? So it turns out that we can essentially prevent this huge potential problem in the literature if you just put this in front of this information at the right time in front of the author. And this has really cleaned up the literature. So again, looking at a piece of um, scientific literature that has an RID, we think that that has much more of the probability to be an authentic use of some of the reagents. Um, and of course, the American Association for Cancer Research um, was quite convinced um, that this is a very good idea because they look at cancer. So, uh, you know, they were quite well um, uh, informed of this issue, but it's a very hard thing with all these, you know, nearly a thousand things for them to check for. So um, looking at something like, hey, we just pull an RRID, um, which actually helps uh, improve the literature seem to be a really um, a winning thing for them. So they have really joined in a big way on the RRID initiative with all their journals. Okay. And now we get back to antibodies, which are some of the most powerful reagents that we have. They're also called biologics in the therapeutic space. And now a lot of the blockbuster drugs, about half, are actually, uh, are actually uh, antibody-like reagents. But we also know that reagents um, such as antibodies, in fact, antibodies, really are the problem in a lot of the reproducibility crisis. There was this lovely piece um, by Monia Baker that talked about blaming the whole reproducibility crisis on the fact that antibodies are either bad, which is about half of them, or antibodies are misused. So we can't do much with bad antibodies other than make notes, but there's so many of them, two and a half million 
that is a lot of notes that we would have to make and we do not have that amount of data. We'd love to get it from you. Um, let us know, please. There's a button at the bottom of the website that says, leave a message. Um, please leave that message if you have it. But the fact of the matter is, is that another company will probably make um, or repurpose one of these antibodies that's bad and you will still see it. But at least we can figure out if there is cross-reactivity variability or the wrong application being used, again, by having uh, various notes. Authentication of antibodies comes down to, this was a, um, a project where basically lots of the SAGE um, antibody uh, um, users uh, in the world had uh, come together and they basically voted, which was cool. Um, what were the pillars of uh, antibody validation? And so the question of how do you validate uh, an antibody experiment was uh, essentially uh, summarized in this really lovely table. Like I don't tell anyone to really read this paper, but this table is awesome. Um, because if you're looking at, for example, immunohistochemistry experiment, how do you do that? How do you validate? Well, one of the ways is you get two antibodies, for example, and you do the experiment twice. And if you do that, that is one way that you can actually validate that something works. Um, however, there's that little tiny pesky problem that some antibodies are actually sold by multiple companies. And so um, if you're doing the same experiment, hopefully it's not the same actual antibody. Um, I have seen that happen to people because they don't know that it's the same antibody. So some of the things that you might wanna look for are, is it actually hitting a different part of the protein? Um, if so, that's good. Um, if a lot of the information or the validation data looks sneakily similar, beware because that might actually be the same antibody that's being used. So um, where we have information, we try to put it out. So in the RID portal, we also have lots of information um, where we know and we are legally allowed to know that information. So for example, um, these three antibodies from Bovinger, Roche, and Millipore are actually the same exact, and you can see the catalog numbers are different, but these are actually the same exact product. And it was because Bohinger um, originally licensed this out of a university. Um, then Bohinger was bought by Roche, and then Roche um, was purchased by Chemicon, and then Chemicon uh, was purchased by Millipore. Millipore was then ca cannibalized by AMD, um, which has now joined forces with Sigma. So it's a very, very complex thing. But as much as we can know, <clears throat> Um, you know, whether an antibody actually moved from one company to another, we try to put that information. And what you'll see is that the ID is the same. There are three different companies, uh, three different catalog numbers associated. And of course, there are lots of uh, PubMed IDs. So these are the, the papers that are associated with, um, with this, including the original paper. Um, so <clears throat> is eLife the only journal that actually does this stuff. Um, in fact, no. Uh, Cell Press family has actually gone a very long way um, to making sure that every one of their papers actually has this lovely star methods table. And this table, you know, again, has all of the links and um, has the identifier sitting right there. It, and in fact, it kind of even looks like a little recipe um, you know, here are the things that you have to get in order to reproduce this study, which is, I think, very cool, very cool little ingredient list. Um, where else can you get these uh, RIDs? Uh, oh, I didn't put the ad gene thing. So in, in a lot of the places where you might acquire your, um, your reagents or your mice or whatever, what you would actually see is a way that these things are being cited using the RID. So here's a, an antibody company. They have an RID. Um, here's the Cellosaurus database, and this is how you cite this particular cell line. Um, the MMRC is one of the mouse repositories, and there you can actually copy the RID citation to Clipboard by just clicking on that one button. It's very cool. Um, and the question is, is it actually making a difference in the literature in whole? 
right? Because if more people use this, so for saying, yeah, well, we have AACR joining, we have um, some of the other journal groups joining, does it make any difference whatsoever when you look across the entirety of the literature? And I will have to say that very recently we've published um, uh, on BioArchive only, so not peer reviewed yet, um, a large analysis across about 2 million um, uh, open access papers. And we looked at them by year and uh, we're looking at, again, that identifiability of antibodies. And way back in uh, 1997, about 10 to 15 percent of the papers actually had a catalog number associated with their antibodies. Um, and then that kind of goes, it goes up a little bit into the 2000s, but not a whole lot. But one of the cool things here in the 2015-2016 um, timeframe, you start to actually see this, this blue line inflect and go up. And now this is not as good as the Vasilevsky paper, which was somewhere in the 50 percentile in 2013. But we're also looking at this just across catalog numbers and we have a, a, an automated tool that is not able to know, you know and pick up everything that a, a human being would be able to pick up. So, but, but what this tool does is it at least does something very similar across all papers, across all time. And so looking at that, we're actually seeing an increase in the identifiability of antibodies, um, and it starts, it's starting to definitely change. So this is now in the 40 percentile, so about 40 percent of your antibodies would be expected to have a reasonably identifying information associated with it, which is very cool. But there are definitely journals that are leading, and there are journals that are lagging. So if we look at Cell and eLife, we actually are leading the, the charge here. So this, um, this implementation uh, basically allows, um, at least in 2019, when we you know, finished looking, um, it allows for nearly you know, 90 plus to 100 percent of, um, of the antibody reagents to be identified easily. And um, when you look at something like PLOS One, which um, does have instructions to authors to, uh, to add RRIDs, but um, I think this is pretty good evidence that nobody reads those um, because the journal actually lags uh, the average and it even lacks OncoTarget, which has had absolutely no change in the instructions to authors. So we're looking at this, um, we are definitely looking at a change across the entirety of the literature, but it is not across the board in all journals. It is happening in some journals, which go way up, and then uh, other journals are definitely lagging behind uh, their colleagues. So we hope to change that. And with, um, with the people, the young investigators here, you're probably thinking, hey, I wanna publish in uh, one of these journals, and I like to do this RID thing, but I use like a whole bunch of antibodies. That's going to take a long time to do this lookup one by one. Well, we might be able to help you. There is a tool called SciScore, which um, is a commercial tool that we have gotten funding through the SBAR mechanism for. Um, but if you go through the ORCID login, then you can access it for free. So you can actually try this today, and all you have to do is find your method section. So here I'm picking on this particular paper for no reason other than this was the top one in PubMed Central. So I, I apologize to these authors, but this is, uh, it's just an example of what you might get. So um, this is the method section that I've copied, and I've pasted it into the tool, and I hit the go button. That's literally all you have to do. And um, then what happens is it creates a, um, a report and this report this particular paper got a five so basically it's five out of ten criteria that it was looking for it found so um, there are a lot of rigor criteria that it goes through things like blinding which are very important for investigator bias assessment power analysis uh, these investigators did not do they did um, actually put in their IRB statement and they put in a consent form which is great but if you look at cell line authentication, they did not do it. So that is unfortunately too common, but um, the cell line authentication um, uh, button will actually not show up unless um, the tool actually detects some cell lines. So um, these are the reagents. And so on the, on the second table, you can see that um, 
there was a statement that actually um, discussed a particular antibody, but in fact, you see that 9.6 here, actually the real ID is actually a 9.5, um, so this one was not resolved. So these authors had actually probably, you know, copied down in their Excel and um, missed a number. Um, then this is the, an example of um, HEP2, which is one of those misidentified cell lines. Um, they had not put in an RID. This is the RID for HEP2, but hey, there's that warning about actually, are you using the right can? Uh, are you using the cell line, um, and do you know if it's the right cancer or not? Um, this is a mouse. Um, but this one is underspecified, so the C57 black 6 is not actually a mouse that can be found. Um, you do have the J strain and you have the N strain, and they actually behave very differently. Um, it turns out the J strain uh, has many fewer GABA receptors, so they become epileptic. Um, so here's, a uh, again, a note about SPSS, and there's a suggestion. So a lot of these suggestions will hopefully help people just, you know, click on them and figure out if that's the right tool. Um, but, uh, and the warnings and things are, uh, are actually starting to be all in the report. So you can take this, you can use it, and it should hopefully help you um, do some of that hard work of looking up one by one all of your um, reagents. So our goal is that every research resource is properly identified using the proper RRID. That's what we want. We want credit to be given to all of the resource providers who made those things. Now, sometimes that's an antibody company. You guys don't care that much, but sometimes that's your colleague. You're, somebody made that plasmid, somebody made that mouse, and it's great to be able to give credit back to that person in a way that's very consistent across all publishers and in a way that um, allows them to very easily type into Google Scholar and ID and then and suddenly all of the papers that actually use the resource come back. So I am asking for you to help. Please put RIDs into your next paper. Um, when you review papers, please review for methods. Methods are really important and people largely don't read them. And what, what you need to do is read the methods in order to reproduce that study. So also, always register all of your cool tools with the proper authority and we can help you with that. Okay, thank you so much. and. Um, I believe that I am just right on time. We had a uh, plan for 20 minutes <coughs> of questions. Thank you very much, Anita, for this uh, really engaging uh, presentation um, and taking us on why we need to use RRIDs. Um, I hope the audience found this uh, really very useful. Um, I'm just looking into the questions that we have, but before that, as a uh, host privilege, um, I'd like to ask a question. Um, so uh, if you have a genetic organism uh, that has a different background, for example, let's say I find a mice strain or a fish strain uh, that was on, that was important <coughs> for me, uh, which was relevant for me, and I took that and I did the you know, back crossing for several generations and now I have this new uh, strain, a completely new strain that would behave differently. So would that get a new RRID? Uh, or is that uh, still listed in the same RRID, but then you just have to mention something new about this particular resource? Um, so if you've gotten something and then you've done substantial amounts of genetic changes to maybe put those particular mutations on a different background, or you have done a lot of crossing and what have you, um, you might do one of two things. So the first thing you might do, and I don't know if this is going to be appropriate in all cases, but you might um, actually want to put that mouse into a, a mouse repository. So MMRC is such a repository. They take lots of mice. They have um, a set of basically questions like, is this going to be a viable thing? That does, does this need to be preserved? And if the answer is yes, <clears throat> they will do all of the work to try and make sure that it's properly named, make sure that it's probably, uh, properly uh, um, derived. Sometimes they'll re-derive it um, if they need to, um, because using some, uh, you know, some techniques in the lab, you don't always get exactly as clean of a, of a um, derivation as needed. 
Um, but then uh, the other you know, answer might be, well, no. Um, and in that case, what you might wanna do is register that with the nomenclature authority. So, um, and really the easiest thing to do actually is to register this with the nomenclature authority. So if I'm going to make a mouse, the nomenclature authority is MGI. And what I would do then is I would fill out a form telling them exactly what I did with my mouse, you know, and they'll ask, there's a little box that says, is this published, is this not published? And if it hasn't been published yet, they're, they're aware that there will be potential, you know, need for an RRID to be created. And what they're able to then do is they're able to create that RRID. They are the authority for, um, for the nomenclature, they're the authority for mouse genetics. Um, and as you can, as you remember seeing, you know, those, those names are quite long and um, none of us, I believe, are trained in nomenclature the way that chemists are. So when we work with mice, we often um, might make nomenclature mistakes, not because we're bad, but just because the nomenclature is actually quite difficult. And, um, you know, we, we need kind of a trained individual to, um, to tell us how to actually do, construct the proper uh, mouse nomenclature. And if, if it's me, I usually ask questions. So um, asking questions is fantastic and asking questions of the right authority um, is, is the right thing to do. So I don't ask somebody who also wasn't trained in nomenclature, I would ask the nomenclature expert. And uh, thankfully, they're out there, they're on email, you fill out a form and they will actually answer you, it's amazing. <laughs> so, um, you know, please use them. Uh, and they will know if, you know, if they say, oh no, this is fine, you don't need to register this as a new thing, we already have this registered, this, this particular type of cross has already been done, you know, three times before, and here's your number. So they're there, they're, they're there to answer um, those kind of questions because they have a stake in the literature being cleaner as well. So um, I hope that answered your question. Um, other questions out there? Uh, yes, uh, thanks a lot for this um, uh, answer. Uh, there are actually a lot of questions coming up. Uh, so there's something, uh, please disregard if this was already covered. Uh, can you speak to the sustainability of RRID database, uh, such as integration with electronic lab notebooks? Um, it, I have not covered that and electronic lab notebooks would be fantastic. We would love to work with electronic notebook providers to give them this data. Um, and then you would be able to hopefully have the RRIDs throughout the entire process and not just at the end, especially with those cell lines. When you buy them, you don't want to, <laughs> you don't want to necessarily waste the, you know, half a year of time um, making them, um, you know, doing a bunch of experiments with the wrong cell line. Um, the, the journal should be only a last step. You should be looking these things up before you buy them. But, um, you know, the fact of the matter is, that many people don't. And um, so I would love to work with, with electronic lab notebooks um, to improve how early we can get to authors. Um, another you know, uh, example that we had before is when you look these things up when you're writing your grant, that would be another really great time to, to be able to look up some of these things because maybe you're planning an experiment, but already something is known about one of the reagents you'd want to be aware of. So earlier, better. <laughs> Thank you. So the next question is, um, are there any plans to link RRIDs with uh, software package databases? Uh, for example, CRAN or R OpenSci, Open similar to the link between RRID and for example, MGI? Um, not at the the moment, but I'm very happy to talk to anyone about that. Um, I would, you know, I, I think that my contact information is is out. I am the right person to at least have a preliminary conversation with. Um, so I would say I'd love to um, have that that conversation, and uh, we certainly do already have um, some uh, uh, code repositories that. Um, 
when uh, authors go in and they register and they put in their code into the code repository, the code repository sends us a packet of information and says, hey, we need an ID for this. And then the ID comes back and all is well. So there's certainly precedent for that sort of interaction with our IDs, um, but we don't have um, those specific uh, repositories integrated. Thank you. Uh, so there's uh, appreciation for your talk. Uh, they've got uh, really valuable insights from this. Um, thanks for that. And um, yeah, so the question is, um, uh, within the RRIDs, are there uh, plants that are listed in the organisms um, database? Uh, no. Um, so we do not have any plant repositories. I would think that Arabidopsis would be the closest one. Um, but so, the, the way that um, we have always told people to uh, reference plants is really by species, and there is uh, NCBI taxonomy. Um, we do have plans to integrate um, the NCBI taxonomy, um, but that has not yet been finalized. <clears throat> but the um, all of the strange critters, uh, and unfortunately uh, at this point, plants are included in the strange critter category, um, um, would, would be covered under NCBI taxonomy. Um, so, uh, but there is no reason why we wouldn't have plants. We just don't have, a, you know, a genetic, a, a genetic stock center um, that has yet been registered. Um, so again, it, it comes from most of the literature really uh, in, in biomedicine is about mice. And so we have really, really good coverage with mice. Um, there are lots of rats also being used, and there are zebrafish and uh, flies and worms and, and others. And so we have good coverage there, but we don't have great coverage in all organisms. Um, there's only one Ambostoma stock center, but um, I don't know actually how many people are actually using Ambostoma. It's not a huge, it's not a huge community. It's not like mice. Yeah, so. I guess that's also going to be problematic for uh, non-standard genetic model organisms. Um, for yeah. example, some random cockroaches or something. Um, I, yeah. I'm sure they're out there. I'm sure you know somebody's using them, and and it's great. And I'm sh I'm certain that they're great animals, and they they should be. But if there isn't a huge community with lots of stock centers, then there's nothing for us to really do other than say, well, it is a cockroach. It does have uh, it does have an ID for that species, but you know some animals just won't have the you know the, the breadth of, of resources that are available for others. Um, and I'm not going to say there's fairness or unfairness. It's just, it's this is the landscape that we, we kind of live in. But I think it's still good enough to have an RRID for those non-standard genetic model organisms. You know, then they could contact the authors or the author's lab. Precisely. All right. Uh, so the next question is uh, asking for your opinion on something. Are you familiar with the BenchSci platform uh, for open source reviews of antibodies? Uh, what are your thoughts on open source reviewing of antibodies? I think it's a very important question. I, I love open source reviewing of antibodies. Um, there are other platforms uh, in addition to BenchSci. I, I know actually some of the guys who, who created BenchSci and um, they're great, they're fantastic. Um, reviewing antibodies is absolutely, I think, critical. Um, but a lot of people are very hesitant. So there are a few thousand um, uh, antibody reviews when I looked uh, on various platforms. Um, and unfortunately, there are millions of um, antibodies. So one of the biggest problems that we have is that there are so many reagents um, and so few of them are actually reviewed. So um, we have a, a different kind of a concept of a review. Um, we have a paper associated with it. Now that does, still doesn't tell you that the um, the antibody is good or bad, but at least if it was used in the paper, it can be looked at. And we're actually looking into how we can use that information a little bit better, um, so that we can expose, you know, what is the type of statement that is being made um, about by the authors about this particular reagent. Um, remarkably enough, it's not an easy thing for a computational tool to pull out, but um, 
reviews are awesome and I, I wish that many, many more of them existed out there. Um, I think wherever you put them is fine. Um, the, you know, obviously for me, I'd say, hey, please use my, <laughs> you know, my platform. Let me know how that antibody um, actually performed. But, you know, giving that review is more important than where you put it right now. And I think if there's a great, you know, form in Benchside, then that will be the place where everybody ends up going. So. Fantastic. Thank you. Um, another long question. Okay. Uh, so for tools such as antibodies, oh, sorry, for tools such as software, I found that the scientific tool that I use is on RRID, but it is the generic software and it does not specify the version. Um, what right. should I do? Create an RRID for exact version of the software I'm using, or I use the general RRID and specify the software version in the manuscript? A uh, great, great question, and I didn't go into that. And um, here is, um, you know, the so there's always the devil's always in the details, right? Um, the the one main criticism that we get with RID is that it is not for the specific version of a software. It is not for the specific lot of an antibody. Um, RIDs are aggregators of information about a particular class of tool. So image J is an example and version, you know, 1.42 or whatever is the specific version. So within the syntax of the, of the full RRID, we suggest that you put the version, the lot, and for um, databases that you might be citing, it's the date of access. So um, you have to add things in addition to just the RRID. The, um, however, we do not have every version. Uh, and if we tried to do that, we would we basically made the decision that this would drive us absolutely insane. And we would um, have, you know, a thousand different identifiers for each of the patches of each of the software projects that we're talking about. And in fact, that's not sustainable. So um, the we push some of that onto the authors. We ask them to add versions, at lot num add, add lot numbers for antibodies, and uh, we have we try to push them to really. Uh, Tell, tell us, um, for example, with cell lines, which specific repository they got it from. Um, but the RRID is meant to say, this is kind of an aggregate thing. And so if you're going to say, there will be some problem with this thing, now all of a sudden that problem is visible to everyone who's using some version of that thing. So um, this is definitely one of the major criticisms of, our, of the RID project itself. Um, we do have a few places where there are specific versions, um, but we're trying to kind of trim those down and aggregate them underneath the, the kind of core resource. Um, so it's, it's meant to bring all the papers about that resource together um, so that they can be sorted through. Thank you. Uh, since we touched upon uh, you know, the problems that can be with RRDs, I just wanted to um, ask your thoughts on uh, the extent of the problems that one could you know, approach with RRDs, particularly uh, what is findable and what is not findable, because we are still you know, into the realm of, although there's like increased um, you know, visibility or increased um, ratio that we could find, uh, but there might be still some resources that are not you know, easily findable. Um, how what, how does that uh, how does one approach that, or how does one use RRIDs for such things? Um, so findability is going to be difficult, right? I mean, with with any well, presumably in a computational study, presumably, you have the best possible chance of having a fully reproducible paper. Um, however. We know that anytime we install a package, there is some crazy little thing that goes to the top of our computer and it says, hey, update this other thing. And as soon as you update that other thing, you have the chance that some of your code is not going to work exactly the same way. When we think about redoing a mouse experiment, the number of factors that are different is huge. We do the best we can. 
And so in a lot of the, the cases where we're talking about reproducibility, I don't think that we actually want to strive, at least in biology, I don't think it's possible to have an exact replication of a particular study. But what we're really going for with RRIDs is transparency. And you put that transparency at a level which makes sense to people. It is what they're kind of doing, but a, maybe one step beyond what they're doing. So that was that was definitely the, the argument that we were making. We were trying to say, we're gonna try to do the best we can. We're gonna all take this one step together. We're going to tell you basically, we used these specific antibodies. And the reason that we didn't ask for a lot initially is no one actually used that, that kind of information in their papers. The number of people that were asking for lots was quite a few and they were getting absolutely no compliance with that. I think in the next five or six years, we'll be able to you know, basically say, well, everybody is using um, RIDs now for antibodies, that's great. Let's now figure out how we can get the lot information and try to move the field a little bit further along but it's not going to be something that we do overnight. We can't take you know, that 100 steps um, to make the, the paper fully reproducible because one, I don't think it's possible. And two, it would drive the poor people who are trying to do this crazy. Um, they already have you know, 100 RRIDs to look up in some of those papers. It's a lot, it's a lot to ask for. Um, and so, we want to do the best we can, and we always want to do the best we can um, in terms of transparency. But, you know, only in a few fields can we actually hope to have a, a fully reproducible paper. And even those fields, we often fail because, you know, some patch is different. And so now the code works just a little tiny bit differently. And hopefully that makes no difference whatsoever because the code was properly tested. But we do know that cortical thickness measurements in MRI studies have actually been reported to be completely different between a PC and a Mac. I mean, those are major issues. Um, and, uh, and when they're discovered, you wanna say, well, how much of the literature has been affected by this potential bug of this code? Um, you're not going to get that if, um, unless you can you know, have an identifier that grabs and, um, and takes all of those piece uh, all of those of uh, all of those papers together and then you can say okay now i'm not looking at every possible thing i'm looking at just this set so now within this set you know which are the the versions that are being used that may have been affected by this particular bug yeah that's very insightful thank you um so uh maybe uh just quickly to close up uh this session um i'd like to ask you um how do any any researcher or any ecr who is listening today uh, would convince their peer next door or next bench um to use rrid in their next paper um but that i would you know like to close that um you know having your comments or thoughts on that um and i'd like to thank uh, all the audience for uh listening in and joining us and I'd like to thank uh, Anita for providing us a uh, real great insight into RRIDs and sharing your uh, excellent thoughts on how we can improve reproducibility. Uh, thank you very much for that. Um, so um, I've seen a few questions, but uh, please keep them posted on Twitter using ECR Wednesday hashtag, and we'll try to get back to those um, since we are running out of time right now. Um, so thanks a lot for joining us uh, for this webinar. Um, so hopefully we'll see um, in the next webinars that we are planning. Thank you. Thank you so much.